welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. I have one announcement to make. Uh, this week, our pastor and Carol will be celebrating their wedding anniversary, and the roses that are on the altar today are in their honor. So would you uh, give them a hand of uh, congratulations. During this past week, I exchanged some messages with Mike Johnson and also talked with Pam. And praise the Lord, they're both here this morning. We're so thrilled. <laughs> and in honor of Pam, we're going to sing the doxology this morning. So we ask you to stand as we all join together and sing the doxology. together and, and share it together. This church uh, has something that I'd be safe to say no other church has. Say, Boy, that's got to be something. I'm telling you, we've got something no other church has. We have an official church cat. And, and if, if, you, if you've not met that beauty, and you haven't been around here very long, I'm telling you, he is faithful. He is Baptist to the bone. Uh, I'm telling you, he's here every time, Sunday morning, Wednesday night. Phyllis couldn't resist the temptation this morning to take a picture of him sitting on the hood of my truck. And what she doesn't know is when she turned her back, he was on the hood of her vehicle. And then Sherry came in and he was over checking out her vehicle. And the fact of the matter is, she left her door open one night and he got in her vehicle. So you check your vehicle before you leave here this morning or you might be taking a cat home with you. I'm just saying that to say to you, you're not going to let a cat outdo you when it comes to attendance. That cat is, that cat is faithful. It, he is here every, every Wednesday morning, every Wednesday night, every Sunday morning. And please, you're not going to be outdone by a cat. And, but seriously, what a blessing it is, what an honor it is to be in the Lord's house, uh, to be able to worship this morning. But by the way, sorry Hayes was not here this morning, but I had to tell us this, if the rain we got the other night were snow, we wouldn't be here. That we would have had three feet of snow. And so I know Hayes would have eaten a heart out about that by now, but nonetheless, we're thankful to be here, and the Lord's given us a beautiful day. He's given us bountiful blessings, many reasons to come, and we welcome you this morning as we worship together. It's just a joy. This time is so brief. You hear me say this, but this hour in the service of the Lord is worshiping Him. It's just so very small in comparison to everything else that's going on in the world, and we welcome you this morning. If you're visiting, uh, greet you in Jesus name if you do not know the Lord as your Savior our prayer is that you'll make that decision this morning and give your heart to the Lord our prayers are with those who are providentially hindered from being with us this morning and pray that they may soon be able to return 
We would like to ask you to please pay close attention to the announcement in the bulletin about the Global Connect and getting Debbie your email address. Uh, this is apparently becoming the, uh, the wave of the future. It's not the future, it's the wave of the present. It really is. And so things are changing. And if you can get that information to her, it will help in uh, you getting the messages in a timely fashion and in a very clear uh, fashion also. With that in mind, we dismiss our children for their worship time. And we ask you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And we're going to be reading verses that are very familiar to you. Uh, we've, you've heard, no doubt, many times about the prodigal son. But we're looking at these verses today for a different reason. And we share that with you as we, as we move forward. Stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word from Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the youngest son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Father, we bow in your presence today, thanking you for blessings beyond measure. Lord, there are many blessings that you have poured out on each of us that we don't even know, we don't even recognize, but they're just as much from your hand and just as much a gift from you. And we thank you for each and every one. What a blessing it is this morning to be in your house with your people, just to fellowship, to worship, to just to enjoy your presence in a special way, in a special place. You set aside this time, you set aside this place for us to come and just to focus our attention on things that really matter, spiritual things in our lives. And you promised to meet us here, and you've always done that. And we always go from this place knowing that our hearts have been encouraged and we've been inspired to be the best testimony and the best witness we can be for the Lord and to share your word with people who don't know we have an added burden each time we come for people who've never trusted the Lord as our Savior. And so this morning, our prayer above all prayers is for anyone who's never trusted Christ as our Savior, this will be the day. Give us now the assurance of your leading and your guiding and your presence. And may each and every one of us say, speak for your servant here in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to remain standing as we prepare and for our celebration and music. And one note I will share with you, when we have a song of five verses, sometimes we look at omitting one of the verses, but in the song one day, we can't do that because it's the gospel. It covers everything from Christ's first coming to his second coming. So just so you know, we have to sing all five verses when we get there. When we get there. <laughs> yeah, right. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see. If I could just take a moment to sure. thank you all for your warm welcome for my mom last weekend. Uh, she really enjoyed the church service. And tomorrow will be her 94th birthday. But unfortunately today, she, Gary, and Daddy are all down with colds. So <laughs> she stayed home. I'm hoping that maybe next week she'll be back with us. But thank you for your warmth because I knew you'd come through. I knew it and I just appreciate it so much. Thank you. Our opening hymn is I Stand in Awe. <laughs>
Our offertory hymn this morning is One Day, All Five Verses. <laughs> <laughs>
this day and that day. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. But that is the day that Jesus Christ is going to come. And this day may very well be that day. He may very well come to take his children home. And so, Lord, we pray if anyone's never trusted Christ as a Savior, they'll do that and they'll be ready for that great change and that great flight that's about to take place. For now, we have business that needs to be addressed. We have a world that needs to be saved. We have people who need to hear the gospel. And this is the gospel that we have just shared and we have just sung. Thank you, Father, for the story. But the story hasn't ended. But one day, the book will be closed and we'll be going home to be with our Lord. Thank you for the privilege this morning of worshiping as we offer these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is one of our favorites. We have to sing it every so often. And Howard, I'm so glad you're here today. Andy's going to put the words up. You are invited to sing along with the choir. And I also had something to, something to add. Um, a lot of you are on Facebook. And uh, every morning when you get up and when you go to check it, it comes up with your memories, you know, of past things you've posted in the last years. So yesterday I woke up and I looked at it and it said that yesterday was the five year anniversary of my family and I walking through those doors for the first time. Wow. I want to thank each and every one of you. You all welcomed us, welcomed us with open arms and to join this church is one of the best decisions we have ever made in our lives and we'll never be able to Thank all of you. Thank you.
no substitute for singing it like you mean it. And there's no doubt about it, they mean it. In the last few weeks that we have been looking at what the scripture has to say about stewardship, and I shared with the people Wednesday night, it was very tempting to put this off for another time, but I believe it's important to bring it all together because there's a part of stewardship that we don't often think about and we should. So often we talk about stewardship, we think about the part that we give to the Lord and that is an important part. We've been talking about that the last few weeks and the responsibility we have of being a good steward, but it includes more than just what we give to the Lord's work. And we've established the fact, first of all, that God owns everything. That's the bottom line. That's the foundation of stewardship. We recognize that everything that we have and are and ever hope to be is in the hands of the Lord. And God owns everything. If we do not have that settled, the other matters are going to be very difficult to arrange as they should be in our lives. We also talked about the part that we give to the Lord, and last week we found out that Jesus was sitting over by the treasury observing what was put in, and we concluded that Jesus is still sitting over by the treasury. He's always watching. He always knows what anyone and everyone gives. But there's more to stewardship than what we give. With that in mind, I want to tell you Stewardship is we are responsible for not only what we give, we are responsible for what we keep. The young man in the scripture that we read today had a lot of faults, there's no doubt about it. He had a lot of weakness, had a lot of problems. But what he had at the heart was poor. He was a man who simply didn't know how to take care of what had been given to him. No doubt you've heard it was disrespectful for him to say to his father that he wanted his inheritance before his father even died. He said, give it to me. I want it. I want it now. And uh, you can imagine that someone with that kind of mentality is probably not going to exercise good judgment in the use of those gifts. Whether or not he knew exactly what he was going to do, where he was going to go, how he was going to spend it, remains to be seen. But once he got his inheritance, shame on him, his life fell apart. The tragedy of it is, I don't know how much his inheritance was, but I'm guessing it was a substantial amount. And I'm guessing he could have been set for years to come if not for his life. As it turned out, the scripture says he made some very unwise decisions. He exercised very poor stewardship. He was not responsible for what he had. And when the scripture says that not many days after the youngest son gathered together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance, we don't really know if it means not many days after he got his money he took off, or not many days after he took off he wasted it all. My guess is both was true. I'm guessing that it wasn't very many days. It wasn't very long after he got his money, he hit the road. And whether or not he knew when he left home what he was going to do, where he was going, how he was going to spend it, remains to be seen. But I'm equally confident that it wasn't many days before he was bankrupt, before he was broke, before the people that he thought were his friends, he found out when the money ran out, the friends ran out too. And here he is, a man who is desperate, destitute, and all because of poor stewardship. Let's be very clear. We are responsible for what we give to God, but we are equally responsible for being good stewards of what is left. If you want to figure the 90% and 10%, the 10% to the Lord, the 90% to yours that you keep, then we are responsible for being good stewards of the 90% that we keep or whatever percentage it may be. The reality of it is, no amount of money would ever be enough for some people. It wouldn't matter what you gave them. They would blow it in no time at all. It would be broke. They would be broke because simply not using good judgment, 
The scripture says, and we're going to be talking about this woman a bit later, but in Proverbs chapter 31, it talks about a godly woman. And in verse 16, it says, she considers a field and buys it. In other words, she took the time to stand back and say, now, is this really a good buy? Is it really a good time to buy it? Should I really spend my money on this particular piece of land? She was ex- absolutely a very wise steward. Godly people need to exercise good judgment and take the time because invariably, if you buy, if you make a decision in haste, you will regret it. Make no mistake about it. There's just something about taking the time to pray through things and, and just to weigh this against that and on and on it goes. This young man simply didn't have good stewardship. He didn't exercise good stewardship. It's been said, and rightly so. We spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. And how very true that is. I don't know that he was trying to impress some people. I'm guessing he was. I'm guessing when he threw his money away and all of his friends, oh, come on, come on, I'm paying for the party. Everything is on me. Friend, let me tell you what. You won't have any problem finding friends if you exercise by that model. But I'm telling you, when you start exercising wide stewardship, things begin to change. And so, the Scripture is very clear. This man went broke in a hurry simply because of whatever else he was. Party animal, you, I don't know. Whatever else he was, he was a poor steward. And it came back to haunt him. Sooner or later, he would come to realize that. Thankfully, he did come to realize that when he said, my father's servants back home have it better than I do. And God bless him for coming to a part in his life when he realized that things weren't that bad at home anyway. The next thing we need to understand, as a good steward, we are responsible for what we save. Remember a moment ago, I mentioned the woman in Proverbs chapter 31. In that same chapter, in verse 21, it says, she is not afraid of the snow, for her children are clothed with garlic. In other words, this woman prepared for tough times and bad days. Let me spell it out to you another way. When the scripture says she was not afraid of the snow, I don't know if she had a TV. I don't know if she listened to the forecast and they called for two inches of snow, maybe as much as four inches of snow, and she thought, oh my word, I've got to get to the grocery store. And I've got to buy 10 gallons of milk, 12 loaves of bread, and all the toilet tissue they got on the shelves. It's going to be, it's panic time. It's panic time. It didn't worry her. We grew up, as many of you did, when we had blizzards, when we had snows, when we stayed home, bound for a week. And it didn't matter. We lived off the land. It wasn't any different than any other time. You need to understand the scripture is very clear. We are responsible for what we save. And by the way, when the scripture says you're responsible for what you save, it simply means this. You save something every payday. You take something out, and over time, you won't miss it. And over time, you will be surprised at how it multiplies. I want to give you a lesson in stewardship on behalf of this church in this same matter. When I came here, all Southern Baptist churches that I know paid $200 a year into the pastor's annuity. That's just the way it was. That's just, all churches did that. Most pastors at that time lived in the parsonage. The church owned the house. So when it was time for them to retire, they had no place to live, 
and they had no money to buy anything. Do you know what $200 a year will get? Not very much. At the Southern Baptist Convention one year, the leadership said, this has got to change, and it did. And I want to commend this church because at some point years ago, they made a change and they recognized the wisdom of providing for the future. The church began to put in 10% of my salary into annuity, and I put in 5%. And that over the years has accumulated into a pretty good figure. I'm not going to tell you how much it is. You may want to borrow some. But I'm, I want to tell you. I will tell you this. God has provided for us. But God has provided because somebody in this church had the wisdom years ago to recognize that it is important to save. And whatever happens, I don't know when I will retire. I don't know when my ministry here will be done. But I know this. I won't be out in the cold. I've got a place to live, and I've got provision for the future because somebody in this church, let's just say this whole church, was very wise in their stewardship. And I'm here today to tell you, when we talk about saving, we're not just talking about the money you put in savings. I'm not just talking about what you have in your checking account, your savings account, your 401 or 501 or whatever it is. I'm talking about saving another way. Any time we go out of this building, the ushers make sure that these thermostats are turned back and the lights are turned off. Sometimes I come in this church during the week and I know somebody's been here. And most of the time I know who it is because the lights have been left on. Do you have stock in Rappahannock Electric? Unless you do, the wise thing to do is poor stewardship. It's just poor stewardship not to turn everything off and not to save everything we can save. We are responsible as good stewards of saving everything we can. Blanche Laws, who lived at Catlett, said years ago, you can drive down the road at night and see who pays their own light bill. You don't understand today, it is such a thing. It's not okay. It's poor stewardship. And make sure you understand it's a responsibility that we have unto the Lord. There's something else the Scripture says that we are responsible for as good stewards. We are responsible for what we owe. If by chance we have a debt, and it's very likely that anybody is going to get through life without having some kind of a debt, some or another. That's just the way it goes. But it is also the Christian responsibility to pay what we owe. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, it says this, Owe no man anything except to love one another. It is dishonest and it is dishonorable to have a debt and have no intention of paying it off. You will find out that most creditors, if you give them something, just give them something, if you make an effort, they are okay with that. I tell you what they're not okay with is when you make no effort and you act like you are defiantly refusing to pay what you owe. We have a responsibility. Zacchaeus, when he had his heart changed by the Lord, said, first of all, I'm going to half of what I get, have, I'm going to give to the poor. And then he said, if I have taken anything from anybody, dishonestly, then I want to pay them back four times what I owe them. And so it is. We understand this. The scripture is very clear. We have a responsibility to the Lord. We have a responsibility to pay what we owe. It's simply a matter of good stewardship. There's something else we have a responsibility for. We have a responsibility of taking care of what we own. Before I came to this church, the Lord provided us with a house in which to live. I've never lived in the parsonage. We've never lived in the parsonage. And the Lord has been gracious to provide for us a house in which to live. But I understand something, and I understand it very clearly. That house belongs to the Lord. 
He has allowed me and my family the privilege of living there. But he's also allowed me something else, the privilege of paying the taxes on it every year. <laughs> and so that's part of the price. That just comes with the territory. But having said that, I understand it is my responsibility as a steward of what God has given. And then that's just one part of it. The house is just one part of it. But I've understood it is my responsibility to take the best possible care I can of that house and ground. We've had people who live somewhere, I don't even know who they are or where they are, who just stop and comment about the landscaping. And Carol says, well, he takes care of the outside, I take care of the inside. That's not really true. Because if it was, I'd pull up every rose bush, every flower on the plate. <laughs> and so, but you understand, when God gives you something, you're responsible not to abuse it. You're responsible for taking the best possible care you can take. One other thing that the scripture is very clear, and I don't know if you've ever considered this a part of stewardship or not, but I want to make sure that from this day forward, you never forget it. In Luke chapter 12, you know the story of the young man who said, you know, I've got so much here, boy, I don't know what I'm going to do with it all. I know what I'll do. I'm just going to tear down my barn, and I'm going to build bigger. And I'm going to say to myself, soul, take your ease. You've got it made for many years. And the Lord promptly said to him, you don't have it made for many years. You don't have it made for many days. This night, your soul is going to be required of you. And then he asked that man a stewardship question. And I don't know if you've ever considered this a part of stewardship or not, but we have to consider it. He asked that man this question, and then he asked us the same question. He said, this night, your soul will be required of you. And then, whose shall these things be? Simply put, and I don't know any other way to explain this, if you do not have a will, you are not exercising good stewardship. But I'm telling you this, if you don't have a will, the state has one for you. And you're not going to like it. I can tell you that now, you are not going to like it. For people who have a will, it is difficult enough to see that things are carried out as they should be. Everybody I talk to who's had to deal with this have talked about how many copies. They go here and they want six copies of this. They want 12 copies of that. They got to do this. They got to do that. You got to jump through this hoop. You got to jump over this fence. And on and on it goes. They don't make it easy. They don't make it easy. But if you don't have a will, you really are not going to have a difficult time. It's going to be disastrous. It absolutely is. And here's the question. And I believe what the Lord would ask us today, what he's asking us. When he asked that young man, and he asked us, then who shall these things be? I think he's asking us, in your life, you are contributing to the Lord's work. And God bless you for doing that. God commend you for doing that. But I do believe also the Lord would want every one of us to do something after he has taken us home to see that we have left something to the Lord's work. I just think that's good stewardship. That's between you and the Lord and the law. But I'm here today to tell you, stewardship is the total package. It's a total picture. And I'm here today to tell you, Everything that we have and are and hope to be, our time is so important. We are to be good stewards of our time. I don't know how we are to figure what part of our time belongs to the Lord. I know there are people who give themselves every week in service to the Lord. And I'll just tell you, you can talk with me about this later. You can mull it over, think it over, and but it's something I have often thought about. We spend basically one hour here on Sunday morning. 
dependent on if you're in Sunday school, you have to extend it a little bit. But one thing I know for a fact, all of us may not have the same amount of money and probably don't. But we all have the same amount of time. Every one of us gets 168 hours a week. And so, while we don't all have the same amount of money, we have the same amount of time. And we spend one hour, two hours, whatever it may be, here worshiping the Lord. And I have often wondered, does my time here in worship on Sunday morning really count to my stewardship in my time for the Lord? Now, I understand it's different for me than it is for you because God has called me in ministry, in full-time ministry. And, but nonetheless, it's really a matter between every person and the Lord as His Spirit leads you to decide how much time am I really given to the Lord in any given week. You can spend that ministering, you can spend it sharing, you can spend it doing whatever you want to do, witnessing whatever it may be. But I do believe that the Lord wants us to be good stewards of our time. By the way, we spend so much of our lives in two primary areas, our health and our wealth. It's been said that we spend our health making our wealth, and then we spend our wealth trying to get back our health. And once it's gone, you don't really get it back. And so the responsibility that each of us have is to decide how do we really spend our time. Do we really take the time to be with the Lord, just to be quiet, just to be still during the week? Or is this the only time that we really turn the motor down? Is it the only time that we just feel like we can take our breath, catch our breath, and just be renewed and revived in our spirit. I think God would want it to be otherwise. I know he would want it to be otherwise. And so I just pray that through these weeks that we have spent together, you'll be able to look at your life, just get out there alone with the Lord one day, and ask him, Lord, Am I a good steward of what I have? I'd have to believe that the young man in the scripture today would know emphatically he messed up big time. He messed up big time. But you know what? Our God is the God of second chance. Our God is the God of recovery. Our God is the God of redemption. And I have been redeemed. I've been redeemed. And I can tell you, the scripture says very clearly, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Make no mistake about it. We really have to be disciplined in our stewardship of our time, our talent, or our treasure. And it is a personal matter between each one and the Lord to do as you know the Lord wants you to do. With that in mind, I trust that in these coming days, just take the time to get alone with the Lord, talk with your family about the matter of stewardship, talk about the matter of what's right, what do you need to do to protect yourself, what do you need to do to provide for yourself, what do you need to do when things aren't always what they are today, because make no mistake about it, they are going to change, sooner or later, one way or another, nothing is going to stay as it is, there are going to be changes. And you really need to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Most people don't want to do it. They're afraid to do it. They're scared to do it. But you have to do it. You really have to do it. To talk about the matter of stewardship. It's that important. Let me tell you what. If it was that important to God, and he thought it important enough to put us what he did in the scripture, then it should be very important to us. What's important to him should be important to us. Because I can tell you what's important to us is important to him. As our worship leaders come, we prepare for an invitation, and that invitation hymn this morning is, I know who holds tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow.
Jesus. Let me say to the church, thank you for the expressions uh, that you've shown on for Carol and me on our anniversary. The flowers are beautiful. The, absolutely, these are beautiful. I want to thank you for giving them to us. I was beginning to think I was going to have to go buy some. So, so, <laughs> thanks, so thank you. So thank you this morning. I, you know, I'll try that. Let me tell you, old age does teach you a few things, and if it doesn't, you won't be old. So, but you probably know by now that uh, maybe if it comes as a surprise to you, <laughs> I'm going to be real hurt. I enjoy humor. I just do. I think we get so much out there in the world that it's good to laugh. It's good to have a light moment. I'm not going to turn the service into a circus, but I just think the scripture's clear. A merry heart is like good medicine. It really is. And we just need to laugh. There are a couple of comics that I enjoy reading pretty much every day. There's usually always something in the paper. Uh, for instance, yesterday it says, some stretch pants have no choice. And so, <laughs> that, that, that. and so, but the, <laughs> I leave that, uh, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> so, uh, you, can, you can take that one and figure it out and talk about it after you get home. But uh, then on the other hand, maybe you don't want to talk about it when you get home. So, but the one, car, one cartoon that I do enjoy is Pickles. Uh, uh, Grandpa is always getting in trouble. And uh, a week or two ago, he was... He had his fishing pole in his living room, pretending he was fishing, and his grandson was there and his little dog, and, and he's fishing, and his wife comes by and says something to him, <laughs> and he says, let's move upstream, Roscoe, the grizzlies are scaring the fish away. <laughs> uh, the next day, he's still there fishing with his imaginary pole, and she says, Earl, when you catch your imaginary fish with your imaginary pole, you give them to me and I will fry them up for your imaginary dinner. <laughs> what I'm here today to tell you is this. When I talk to you about the Lord and anything and everything pertaining to the Lord, it's not imaginary. It isn't. It's real. It's real. And there are some things that we walk by faith and not by sight. There's some things we don't see. There's some things we can't touch. Some things we can't feel. But they're just as real nonetheless. And I want you to know today that when I tell you about a place called heaven, it's not imaginary. It's real. It's real. When I tell you a place called hell. It's not imaginary. It's real. And as someone said, whether or not people ag agree or think that it's any such place as hell, it's still there and you're still going. So here today I want to tell you, I want you to know this, heaven is real. Heaven is real. And the way it will become reality one day is because you make a genuine, real profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Not imaginary, not pretending. We're not doing any of that. This is for real. I know who holds tomorrow. That's real. There are a lot of things that I don't know about tomorrow. But I tell you, I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I know who holds my hand. And I ask you to make that same commitment this morning. In other words, let your life be a matter of good stewardship. And it all begins by giving your heart to the Lord and asking him to take charge and take control. And he'll do that as we stand and as we sing. Cindy, would you lead us? <laughs>
past weeks have been a learning experience for us, been a challenge because you have raised some issues, brought them to the surface, things that we need to know and may not have considered about the matter of stewardship. Lord, we understand that it includes the total life. It's a part of everything that we have and are and ever expect to be. Thank you, Father, because you have been gracious enough to entrust us with the things that you have given. May we be wise enough as the Spirit leads us to do the right thing with what you have given. Again, thank you for the faithfulness, the stewardship of the people in this church. Thank you for the testimony that they offer how much they love the Lord and how much they love to be a part of his work and how much they want people who don't know the Lord to come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, today that you've allowed us to be the steward of all that you have provided and one day we'll give an account of how we have done what you've given us to do. In Jesus' loving name. Yesterday, Ms. Orlee was planning to come home today. And when she left Fauquier Hospital to go to rehab, they were amazed at the progress she had made at the hospital. And they said they didn't think she would be in rehab longer than seven days. She was there five days. <laughs> and so I think the plan is for her to be back here next Sunday. And that would not surprise me at all. And so we just keep in prayer those of our church family who have special needs, physical needs, and we're just asking once again for you to do everything you can to keep everybody healthy. And that's, uh, that's our goal, and we'll get through this together. With that in mind, we'll be dismissed, and what else can we say but what you just sang? I know who holds tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow. Amen. Amen.